actually have live. So for those of you that um, don't know Taking Control Your Diabetes, we have, um, it's an organization that's been around since 1995. And we typically put on conferences around the country uh, for people with type one, type two diabetes, and also folks with type three. Uh, use significant others that go around telling us what to do and how to do it. But we know it comes from a place of love. And then this thing came along called novel COVID-19. I'm sure you must have heard of it. And basically, uh, start video camera. Okay. You can, there, you go. there we go. Gosh, you heard me talking, you know, uh, learning how to use Zoom. <laughs> and um, the, along came this thing called COVID-19. And all of a sudden, we're quarantined. And everybody uh, is at home, scared to death, working, working from home, staying at home. And for those of you that have lost your, your jobs, uh, it's been a tough situation. And we hope that the situation lights up uh, soon. And we certainly hope all of you are safe and, and sound. And so instead of doing these conferences live, where you really can't replace the camaraderie you get, hanging out with your buddies, talking and learning together, having lunch, doing social activities. Um, it, nothing really can replace that. So what we're gonna try to do is do our conferences over the next several months, as long as uh, large group gatherings are prohibited and try to do some interactive fun sessions. So basically um, I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Jeremy Pettis, and literally one second before the, this program started, his computer crashed. So we're gonna be kind of back and forth. Uh, and you certainly can see my slides and I wanna just tell you what's gonna to happen tonight. Uh, Dr. Pettis is gonna talk about COVID and type one diabetes. I'm gonna jump in and uh, we're both gonna do a tag team. And uh, you know, I'm really glad I brought my mask since we're gonna be approximately six feet apart. Uh, after he finishes, we're going to answer some questions. Then I'm going to get into a really um, uh, difficult topic to cover in 25 minutes, which is hybrid closed loop systems. I'm really going to go over the clinical um, manifestations of them, the clinical details of them. And what dawned on me when I put this lecture together that many of the problems I see in clinic and Jeremy sees in clinic, looking at the CGM downloads, so many of those problems, all the things that all, many of you are struggling with, seem to go away when you let the pump take care of your insulin needs for the most part, instead of all of us trying to figure out what to do. Um, so listen, these are the updates. And I wanna quickly say a few things about TCOID website. Uh, we do have a section where we have Facebook groups for people with type one, people with type two, and also people with type three diabetes. Uh, a, a phrase coined by Bill Polonsky. Uh, who is the significant other, the caretaker, and they are so important to us, but they need to be educated too, not only on the educational needs of diabetes, but also how to interact with us folks. Like whenever my girlfriend Jamie says to me, you can't eat that piece of chocolate cake. You know what I say? Watch this. Uh, and uh, no, I'm just kidding. And then uh, also on our website, a list of all our future conferences, both virtual and live, hopefully soon. There's a section uh, called, called Diabetes Topics A to Z. And this is where you can type in, a, in our search engine from our own website, and you can get stories and videos on any topic that you like. And I, I can point out that we've done several Facebook Lives on COVID and diabetes. Um, and we also have several articles about hybrid closed loop systems. I wanna give a special thanks to our partners. Uh, these are all excellent organizations that help spread the word about all of our programs. I've said this so many times, too many organizations work in silos. No one organization could do it all, but together we can do quite a bit. And I wanna thank our organizations on the screen. And lastly, I do wanna have a really special thanks to our corporate sponsors. They, they support our organization, all the programs we do in the form of unrestricted educational grants. And that's because 
they, they don't tell us what to say or how to say it. They believe in education and they support many of the organizations and our partners that I showed you on the previous slide. So I think there's no better time where there's a need to support diabetes education uh, and many of the other uh, things that the other organizations do. So with that, um, I think this is the housekeeping announcements. Please use the chat feature of your Zoom to connect with others on the webinar. Use the Q&A feature to send us questions. So remember, we're gonna have some questions right after Jeremy speaks, and then after I speak, we're both gonna be going back and forth uh, because we both know a lot about each uh, of the topics. And uh, we received many questions already. And just to let you know that we will be answering the, all the questions on our blog if your question isn't specifically answered tonight. And for those of you that have been to our unbelievable weekend uh, in San Diego called One, the ultimate conference and retreat for adults with type one diabetes. Um, unfortunately this year, uh, it's in August 20th and we're gonna have to make it virtual, but we're gonna do everything we can to make it as fun and interactive as possible. And we already have a date uh, at the same Paradise Point Hotel next year to have it live. Okay, so um, I believe it's my, uh, it's time to introduce my good friend and colleague, Jeremy Colley, <laughs> Jeremy Colley, Jeremy Pettis. And uh, he's going to go first. And Jeremy, come on. All right. Take off your mask, okay? Okay. So we got a physically tag team here because like Steve mentioned, my computer literally one minute before we went you know, live just crashed. So obviously I can't do this, but now I hope my computer's still alive. And it's great to see that I have a Jägermeister virtual background going, Steve. So apparently I'm in a Jägermeister oh, wait distillery. A second. <laughs> hey, that's that's ridiculous. Uh, it's fine. So anyways, <laughs> so we're going to start this with a, a poll just to hear where you guys are from. So right now we're just going to have Sarah put up a, a question just to see, you know, now that we're doing these virtually, where everybody is, you know, across the country. So Sarah, if you can do that, just throw up the poll. Um, and everybody take a second just to click on where they're from. And then I think once everybody votes, we'll be able to get the answers. There we go. Got rid of the virtual background in the meantime. Okay. So hopefully everybody's finished voting. And maybe I can close this now. Oh, here we go. All right. So hopefully you guys can see the results too. We got about 57% of people from the West Coast and then a, a sprawl from all over the country. So Hats off to the 15% of you who are on the East Coast right now. So it's 940 right now. So thanks for tuning in. Um, but the, the point of this is that I'm glad we're doing this because you know these spotlight series, or what we call them, have always been obviously in-person events kind of locally here in San Diego. Um, and this, I think, um, this next slide, whoops. Well, I cut that out. These have been like very kind of grassroots things. And usually we have maybe 50, maybe 100 people here that kind of come, you know, after work. So we're trying to make, you know, lemonade out of lemons that now we're able to reach, you know, we have 485 people online right now. So obviously a lot more people that we're able to kind of reach from all over the country. So we're very excited that, you know, to try to take some positives from this COVID situation that whereas it used to be this very local thing, and to be honest, nothing takes the place of kind of these in-the-person events. So we want to get back to doing those, but we're glad that we can do these now for so many people. All right, so let me get into my talk. And it's going to be about COVID and type 1 diabetes, which could be honestly, um, you know, I could talk forever about this. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to highlight that there's a lot of noise out there. You know, there's a lot of people kind of telling you different things. And it doesn't matter if you listen to the president or Fauci. Um, who might have differing opinions in the same, you know, day or the same hour. And then you've got the governors, you know, we have Newsom here in Cuomo, in New York, that are, you know, might be saying different things. And then you have your local mayors. So I just kind of have a, 
um, this is Mayor Quimby from The Simpsons, who I love, um, who might be telling you something different, depending on what your local situation is. And then you have, you know, late night hosts and Fox News and all these different things that are kind of coming at you. And it can be really hard to know what to believe and really kind of what to think about diabetes and COVID. But one of the things that it's always been a consistent message um, from all of this, from the very beginning, um, when we heard about COVID, we heard a couple things. You know, we knew that it was a new disease and we knew that people were dying. And when you heard about who was dying, it was, it was two things. It was people that were older, whatever that means, and then it was people with diabetes. Um, and, you know, that was the consistent message that having diabetes was bad. So if you're living with diabetes or type one diabetes, you might wonder, and this is a picture of me wondering today, I think I look something like this, um, that um, does this apply to me? I have type one diabetes, but when people are saying diabetes, they just say diabetes, does that apply to me? And a very important message I think um, from this talk in general is that diabetes does not equal type one diabetes. So when you hear people talking about diabetes and COVID is this and is that, in general, it does not apply to you if you have type 1 diabetes. And that goes for pretty much every time you hear anything about diabetes, um, whether you know it's a, it's a cure or whatever it might be, that when people in the media generally talk about diabetes, they're talking about type 2, just because there's more type 2s in the world that, you know, than there is type 1s. So that's a key message. When you hear diabetes, don't automatically think this applies to you, but then it brings up the question, well, well what does apply to me? Am I at higher risk? Um, what if I get COVID? Am I at higher risk for complications? All those kinds of things. So that's what I'm going to dive into a little bit more. So first of all, is getting an understanding of your local situation. Because everything is so different depending on where you live. Um, and that's been one of the frustrating things about this, that, you know, we're obviously in California here, but San Diego is very different than our neighboring county, Los Angeles, and, and Orange County. So in LA, which has been hit very hard by this, They're, they have a shelter in place, you know, order through July. Um, Orange County, on the other hand, is, is looking to open up restaurants, you know, literally any day now. And San Diego is kind of somewhere in between. So there's websites like this for every kind of region. And this is our San Diego case rate. Um, I used to go to this every day, literally, and I'd be kind of waiting for the new data to kind of drop every day. And what this is, is since this kind of started in March 14th, uh, all the way to now, the, the kind of the, the green bar, if you will, is the total number of cases in San Diego. And then the orange bar is in the, the number of cases, the new cases for that day. So I'm using San Diego as a reference point, but this data is available, you know, pretty much wherever you live. And for me, what I look at is that overall we have 6,000 cases. You can see that's the total number of cases. And then per day, you can see that it's been pretty constant. You know, we have anywhere from 50 to 100 cases per day, um, which is good. You know, we did a good job of kind of flattening the curve. We would like to see these numbers, you know, keep coming down. Keep in mind that as we test more patients and more people, we'll probably see these numbers go up. Um, but this is just kind of good data to have. Because again, if I showed an LA picture, it would look very different. And obviously, if I showed Manhattan, it would be very different. So um, the number of cases are obviously still increasing. The other thing to look at in your local area, and not to be too morbid, is the number of deaths. So in all of San Diego County, we have 222 deaths. This was data as of you know, a couple days ago, two days ago. Um, keeping in mind in San Diego County, we have about 3 million people. So 222 deaths, not to minimize it, but um, you know, it could be worse. Um, and deaths, you can't, it doesn't matter how many people you test. This is a very hard metric to kind of keep an eye on. So, Unfortunately, this is something that, you know, is killing people, that we have these infections. So we know that. We know that this is a serious disease. Um, and then I just put these case rates together because you might wonder, you know, how does your area compare to the overall United States? And in the U.S., we have about 1.5 million cases now and about 91,000 deaths. You know, so that's, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people passing away from this which means that about 6% of people, so if somebody gets COVID in the United States, you know, the, the chance of them passing away from it is, is 6%. In San Diego, you can see a couple things, you know, and again, I'm just using this as a, as a reference point, and a lot of people join here probably from San Diego. We have a very small proportion of those cases, cases a very small number of, of deaths, and a case fatality rate of about 3.7%. So I don't think this means that, you know, we have some magical bullet here in San Diego. 
um, but for whatever reason, our case fatality rate has been a little bit lower. These are just kind of baseline or background information. And just, I threw this up here because the seasonal flu uh, fatality is about 0.1%. So I think this message has gotten out there now, but when you know COVID was kind of first happening, there was a lot of people saying, this is just the flu. Why are we getting so excited? This is not the flu. And I think we need to, to be clear on that, that this is a much more fatal disease. You know, it's orders of magnitude more than the flu, unfortunately. Um, so comparing, comparing COVID to the flu is like comparing a, a cold to, to cancer. I mean, it's just a different ball game. So we need to understand that this is a, a, a serious disease and it does have a fatality rate with it, associated with it that unfortunately is, is unlike what we've seen with other infections in kind of recent history. All right, so now let's get to you with diabetes. So maybe you're freaked out sitting at home, maybe you're not, maybe you don't care, um, somewhere on that spectrum. And you wanna know, does having type one diabetes increase my risk of getting COVID? And people are all over on the map on this. You know, you think I have diabetes, so am I more like somebody with type two diabetes, but it's an autoimmune disease, and that, does that mean my immune system is better or worse? And really the short answer to this is that the answer is probably not. But the kind of party line on this is that just because you have type 1 diabetes, and especially if you're otherwise healthy and you control your blood sugars, you're not really at any higher risk of getting COVID-19 or coming down with coronavirus. So that's something important to know, that just because you have type 1 diabetes doesn't mean you need to stay at home any more than kind of your, your neighbor or, you know, the person across the street or whatever. So this is data that I was able just to pull from UCSD about a week ago. And again, as an illustrative case, um, because I have this data, is, you know, what's the, the chances if you go in or somebody says, I have a fever, you know, I've maybe been in contact with somebody with COVID, what's our rates at UCSD? If somebody goes in and gets tested, what is the likelihood of them becoming or having a positive test? And you can see at UCSD, we've tested a lot of people, almost 9,000. I'm going to show you the type one data just to keep you in suspense a little bit. So we tested almost you know, 8,000 people without diabetes and about 4% of them are positive. So right there you see that if somebody comes in with a fever and suggestive symptoms of COVID, there's still a 96% chance that they have something other than COVID. Um, so I think that in of itself is interesting. And then you can see we have a number of type twos that have tested positive, but the percent of these is the same. So it tells me that it, just because you have type two diabetes, doesn't mean that your risk of testing positive is the same. And then the type one data is also right in line with that. So again, this is just local data. But first of all, I think it's kind of amazing that we only have five people with type one diabetes in the whole UCSD system that have tested positive. And the percent of those cases is identical. So again, it tells me that if you have type one or type two, or you don't have diabetes, the chances of you, if you have a fever or whatever that being COVID is, is the same if, if you don't have diabetes. So I think that's good news. And the other thing is, again, just these five patients, anecdotally, you know, the type one's a pretty tight knit community. And I think if we knew that type one or COVID was just, you know, running through patients with type one diabetes, we would know that and that we haven't really heard that. So I think that the bottom line here is that if you have type one diabetes, um, you're probably not at higher risk. So that's good news. The follow on that to that naturally is, does having type 1 diabetes increase my risk of having complications if I do get it? So, all right, great, Jeremy, you told me I'm not at higher risk. What if I do get COVID-19? What are the outcomes from that? And really the answer is that you probably are at higher risk of getting some complications of COVID, um, but almost all of the data comes from type 2 diabetes. So you just have to keep that in mind. So let me go through some of the type 2 data because it's, it's the closest that we have and it, you know, I understand completely that type one and type two are very different diseases, and that's important to keep in mind. Different ages, different risk factors, different you know, risks of cardiovascular disease, et cetera. Um, but this is where all the doom and gloom comes from when you, when you hear kind of on the, um, on the news. That having type two diabetes, this is from the largest study actually from China, that having type two diabetes increased mortality from 2.7 to 7.8%. So basically, if you had type two diabetes in this, this patient population, you had about a threefold risk of dying from COVID. So that, that is scary. And having type two diabetes also made you at higher risk of needing oxygen and going on a ventilator therapy. Um, so again, not a good thing. But what was interesting in this study that they found is that 
if patients were well controlled while in the hospital, in terms of keeping their blood sugar in this particular study between 70 and 180, the survival of these patients with type 2 diabetes was almost 100%. So this is a graph basically showing that, that this is time you know, after getting you know, a positive test and looking at percent of people that survived. And if people were well controlled in the hospital, it was about 100%, and that definitely went down when people were not well controlled. So that doesn't mean that if you just you know, have good diabetes control in the hospital that you're immune from COVID. It might mean that these people that were more sick probably had more labile blood sugars and things like that. Um, but it's just some data showing that um, glycemic control, blood sugar control is something that we know probably does help, especially when you're in a hospital. Now, this next slide is complicated, but the take home point of, of it is this is that also your glucose control, again, mostly in type 2 diabetes, but this data that I'm going to show you is from people with type 1 also, that your A1C before you get an infection also really matters in terms of how well you do after getting an infection. So this study was looking at people with type 1 or type 2 diabetes that got any infection. So this isn't COVID related. This is pneumonia, UTI, sepsis, all these things. And what it shows is that basically if you don't have diabetes, they just say your risk of being hospitalized for an infection is, they just call it one. And then as your A1C increases, so you can see starting from less than 6%, going all the way up to 11%, your risk of being hospitalized for an infection goes up dramatically. So it's not just as simple as you have diabetes or not, your blood sugar control is key. So I'm not gonna go through all the other data points of this slide, but that's basically what it's showing that your, your A1C or your glucose control matters in terms of hospitalization for any infection. And then actually, again, not to be too morbid, but dying from that infection um, really matters how well you're controlling your glucose. And you might wonder why, but the, the basic kind of underlying principle is that when you control your blood sugars, you're getting you know, enough insulin, that that actually helps your immune system function. All right, so take home points from this is, your risk of getting COVID-19 is probably not any higher than anybody else. Good news. Your risk of complications if you get COVID is probably slightly higher, but that really depends on how well your blood sugars are controlled. Also, all your other health conditions, if you have heart disease, kidney disease, all these other things really kind of come into the fold. So follow all the precautions. And this is really important for us with type 1 diabetes. Um, do all the hand washing, wear masks. You know, it kind of breaks my heart that wearing masks has become a, a political statement. Um, but we really need to be wearing masks. And if you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for the people around you. It's incredibly important. Keep up with the social distancing and try to be a champion, you know, for others around you that these things really matter in terms of reducing, reducing the risk of getting this disease. All right. So transitioning a little bit, forget COVID. What is the effect is quarantine is having on my blood sugar? So hopefully nobody on this call has COVID or has had COVID, but everybody is dealing with quarantine, you know, or, you know, staying at home or whatever it might be in your local, you know, situation. So people want to know what's this, how's this affecting my blood sugar, all these things that are happening during quarantine. And it depends, you know, I've seen patients that are doing much better. I've seen patients that are doing much worse and I've seen everything in between. So my point here is just being aware that everything has changed because of quarantine. Like when you think of things that affect your blood sugar, it is different right now. Whether it's your food choices, like, well, gosh, you know, when I was at work, I used to eat, according to this picture, broccoli and salad. And now maybe I eat more, you know, pizza and hamburgers or whatever it is. And I started off pretty good, you know, making good food choices. And then, you know, now I found that I'm door dashing and Uber eating everything, um, whatever I want. Um, and, and I haven't been to the gym in several months, and that was a good source of exercise for me. You never ate broccoli before, Jeremy. <laughs> Tell them the truth. Steve is five and a half feet away from me, so can you just scoot a little bit? <laughs> um, so, um, and then this picture is just is people just walking at work, because that was a lot of just activity that I got, it was just kind of walking around and, you know, not even really realizing it maybe sometimes. Um, and then I don't know about you guys, but I have an Apple watch and it, it just goes off all the time right now. It says, check your activity rings because it thinks I'm dead because I'm just not <laughs> doing anything anymore. Um, so that's something that, you know, be aware that my, my diet has changed, my activities change, not just going to the gym, but how much I'm moving during the day. Um, but there maybe are some positives. 
um, you know, maybe people are less stressed. I feel that the world is definitely slowed down a little bit. That, that can have positive effects on your blood sugar. Um, I found that I've probably been sleeping a little bit more. So there's definitely some positives and some negatives. The point of this slide is to be aware of this, that everything has changed that is affecting your blood sugar. So if you're noticing a swing one way or another, just be kind of mindful of it. Um, and there was one study that looked at this. I thought it was interesting. So there's the Spanish flag here because this is in Spain and I like the Spanish flag, it's kind of cool. And what they did, they did 150 type ones and they looked at their CGM downloads two weeks before kind of the national lockdown went into place and then five weeks after being on quarantine, shelter in place, all those things and just asked the question, what happened to people's you know, glucose before and after? And they found that in general, things actually slightly improved for people that were on quarantine. Of course, some did worse, some did better, but the A1C actually came down a little bit. Time and range increased in this study slightly um, and no change in hypoglycemia. So, you know, maybe you're saying my blood sugars are better. Maybe you're saying they're worse, but just again, be aware that, that it, it's to be expected because everything's changing. Steve and I were talking about this and I think my blood sugars are about the same, maybe a little bit worse, maybe a little bit better. To be honest, I don't know. I just feel a little less healthy because I'm just not moving as much and I definitely started eating like crap, but I am sleeping better and less anxious probably. So take home points from this. Be mindful that everything that affects your blood sugars has changed with quarantine. Make sure to check in with yourself about how your control is doing and uh, ways you might be able to stay on track. And the last one says just call your mom. Um, just to remind me that, um, you know, there's, we have more time. So maybe take this time to, whether it's checking your, with your diabetes or call your mom or whatever, um, take some time, settle down and do some things that maybe you've been putting off for a long time. All right. So my last question, how do I keep in touch with my provider? An answer to this one is, is simple telehealth. So if you're feeling like you're all alone, your diabetes is out of control, almost every system now has moved to, to telehealth. You know, Steve and I at UCSD, we see all our patients virtually now. I can see them in my office. I can see them at home. I can see them in my car, whatever, over the phone. And I actually really like it. You know, people don't have to stress about going through traffic, coming to the, to the doctor's office when they, they don't need that, that exposure. Um, you do need to plan ahead for it. We actually have a, a, a video specifically about this on our TCOID website, making sure you get all your CGM information, pump information to the clinic beforehand so they can um, you know, treat you. So this is a, a scene from our uh, TCYD uh, YouTube video that was virtual visits with your doctor pants optional. And as you can see, this is Steve here in his um, yellow slash green skibbies. I was in my just transformer shirt and I had some kind of nice flannel pants on. Steve wasn't wearing pants. Um, but the point here is that this, you know, it's an opportunity to be casual. I can see patients that are, that, you know, are away from college now. They might be in New York or whatever. So there's some positives of telehealth. So if you're feeling isolated, you know, really the, the, the message here is reach out. You can have phone calls with your providers. Um, don't feel like you can't see your medical team until this is over. Um, the last slide I have is just to, to promote something I think is going to be really cool. So we do have a patient with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, I believe, right, that we're going to actually interview. Just type 1. Just type 1. So, you know, that had uh, COVID-19 and, you know, what it was like. Um, what's it like to get through, you know, COVID-19 in general, but also with, you know, type 1 diabetes, your blood sugars, all those kinds of things. I honestly don't have any patients with COVID-19, so it'll be... Uh, I think a good experience to see, you know, firsthand what that's like. So this is on May 29th. Um, so tune in for that. So right now, I think we're going to pause and ask, you know, see if there's a few questions and then Steve will do his talk. How are we doing on time? Yeah, it's uh, 7.01. Okay. So we got a time for a few questions. Um, and this says, I hope you liked it, but don't ask questions. I got rid of the don't. So please ask questions. Um, <laughs> and let me... Um, how do you escape, Steve, so I can see the escape? Right. Yeah. Okay. So here's the... You, want, you can hide your slides. You can unshare your screen okay, and go to chat. Well, let me stop sharing. Okay. Q&A. Oh my gosh, we got a zillion questions. Um, is there a hybrid or closed loop? <laughs> Yeah, do you want to do your slides and then I'll what? kind of look through this yeah, question. Yeah, it's seven o'clock. Okay, 
there might be folks on there that have antibodies to COVID and don't really care what the Q&A is. <laughs> and so why don't I give my talk? Okay. And uh, can you put my slides back up? I don't know. Okay, I'll up. do that. Um, yeah, we, we have a lot of questions and there's a ton of people on tonight and we appreciate everyone jumping on. I'm gonna to go to my slides and I'm going to share my screen and uh, I'll be up in two seconds. One thing I realized is that as Jeremy was going through the stats, um, it's amazing how different every state is in terms of how they're doing. So, okay. Um, I'm gonna go here and assume that you guys can see my slides. I gave Jeremy a little tripod in case he wants to go on his <clears throat> iPhone. So what I'm gonna talk about it. Did you share your screen? Okay. Um, someone text me at our office if, <laughs> if, the, if you cannot see the slides, but I believe I'm on. Um, we're at the TCOID office. For some of you joining late, I mean, talk about Murphy's Law. We practiced this yesterday. We got everything ready. And literally one minute before we started, Jeremy's computer went down. And normally we'd be in different areas. And of course, you know, I've made him put on his mask and we're using the same computer. He's gonna to try to fix his while I'm, while I'm starting. So we're talking about, you know, dealing with COVID. And once again, really hope everyone's doing well. Um, but one thing that, is truly amazing is what's happening in the area of type one diabetes. I mean, Jeremy and I were kidding the other day, you know, we're seeing all these people coming in on hybrid closed loop systems and they don't really need us anymore. Their A1C is good, their time and range is good. They're not having any hypos and it's just a social meeting. Um, you know, we get paid for that. So keep, keep making uh, video visits with us. And by the way, we can see people anywhere in the world now. So if you wanna, Give us, a, give us a ring, we'll tell you how to make an appointment. Now, um, I'm gonna quickly go through the different hybrid closed loop systems. The Tandem Control IQ, I'm going to spend a little more time on because it's the newest. I'll mention the, and talk about the Medtronic 670G, and I'll talk about looping. Many of you are out there looping, and um, um, there's also multiple daily injections, multiple daily injections not using a CGM, and insulin pumps with a CGM and without a CGM, but no communication. So we're gonna do a poll now. You're gonna answer one through five, and that way you'll get an idea of the folks watching this webinar uh, tonight and seeing what's happening. So if you can click your answer on there, uh, we'll give you a few seconds and we'll give you a chance to answer the question. I'll be very interested to see because uh, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of reasons why people can't take advantage of the technology. And I'm here to convince all of you naysayers about you don't want to wear something on your body on that, uh, or that you're already wearing a pump, but without the connection and the communication between the CGM, then, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to convince you that you may consider uh, doing something different. So, I don't see the answers on here, and uh, there they are. So, mo a lot of you folks are using a hybrid closed loop system, uh, multiple daily injections uh, with a CGM, which is awesome, and hopefully some of you guys are using the in-pen to help you with that, and then a smaller number of people uh, using the other choices. So, all right, let me start, and I think this will generate a lot of questions. And I'm hoping to give you guys some new information. And this is information that's here and now. So I'm gonna talk about these different hybrid closed loop systems. First, a couple introductory slides. This is a doctor slide, but hey, uh, screw them. We, we're smart enough that we can understand what's going on. Um, this is, uh, you can see the glucose variability on the upper curve, and you see the glucose variability on the lower curve. And you see the highs and lows circled. And guess what? these patients have the same exact A1C. So there's a very good video on the TCOID website and it's one of our most watched videos. And it, the title is, and you can put it in our little topics from A to Z, why the A1C sucks and why time and range is so much more important because that's where it's all at. 
A1C is something that predicts long-term complications. It gives our caregivers something to beat us up on, uh, not all of them, of course. And um, it doesn't really tell us what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, this is a graph showing the time and range. This is it, folks. Um, time and range. Uh, the range is, is uh, officially defined as the percent of time your blood sugars are between 70 and 180. And of course, time above range is important. And very importantly, time below range. Uh, between 55 and 70, you should be no higher than 4% of your numbers. And below, below 55, uh, you should not be more than 4% of the time. And this is something to, really good to remember because I want all of you to pretty much look at your own download data, whether no matter what sensor you're using, whether it's Dexcom or the uh, Medtronic sensor or the Eversense sensor or the Libre, that they all give you this data. Now, here's a typical download. On a different uh, webinar, we're going we're gonna to throw up a bunch of these and challenge all of you to analyze them. But first of all, just take a look at this. A1C looks pretty good. Now, that A1C is based on uh, your average glucose. And believe it or not, this may surprise some of you, this A1C estimate is more accurate than the laboratory because the laboratory can be off. If you're pregnant, if you're anemic, if you have chronic kidney disease, if you're a certain ethnic group, I know African-Americans, it could, it could give it an abnormal level. And so I love this. And I think the laboratory A1C should be called the estimated A1C. So believe that number. It's based on your glucose values and things don't change the, the accuracy of measuring your glucose. Look at the average glucose, that's unbelievable, 98. Standard deviation, we're trying to shoot for less than 50. Look at the time and range, it's above 72, 70%. This person's looked like they're doing good, but take a look. 24% of their values are in the hypoglycemic range. So this person, and if you look at the 24 hour profile down below, you see all the little red things below 70. This is something to really pay attention to. So this artificially lowers the A1C, it looks, makes your average look really good, but this person is very constant, standard deviation 34, something easy to fix. And this would be fixed with a hybrid closed loop system. Now, I'm sorry for the quality of this slide, but I was in clinic and I just took a quick snapshot with my camera. And I wanna point out that this is a, a young man uh, who's a veteran and he, we got him a CGM. He's only had type one for less than, less than a year. And you can see, you know, he's not doing that great. And I thought I would show you that I don't think I've ever had a patient with only 9% time and range. And the next time we saw him, he was up to 30%. So, you know, getting on a CGM, um, he's on multiple daily injections with, with basal and prandial insulin. You know, it's a learning curve. Uh, and that's why it's important that you can't just start a CGM without education. Uh, and you also have to get used to it yourself. Here's another download of another patient and you can see uh, average gluc glucose 172, uh, standard deviation 77, time and range is 54%. And then I think I wanna show you the value of the 24 hour profile. You can see he gets high at night, he boluses and then he gets low. Uh, and then of course he bounces up really high because he eats everything in the kitchen sink. So if you can fix that part of the day, that one problem, then his numbers will improve greatly. Here's a patient who's not doing that well. Guess why? His alert, his upper alert is set at 390. If your alert is set that high, it defeats the purpose of wearing a CGM. So why did I show you these downloads before I get into the hybrid closed loop systems? Because many of these problems are alleviated with these hybrid closed loop systems. You don't set your goals uh, pretty much. I mean, it, it shoots for a normal range or a near normal range whether you're, uh, you're going throughout the day or exercise or at night. So let me just tell you about some of them. And I, I think that, um, you know, as I said earlier in my introductory talk, just amazing how so many patients who have switched over to one of the systems I'm gonna be talking about are totally under control. I mean, just amazing to me. So up until these systems were developed, this was my favorite quote. The best way to control type 1 diabetes, stand perfectly still and not eat a thing. And if your basal rate is set perfectly, 
You're just even Steven all day long. But we all know that is pretty much impossible. So let me talk about the tandem control IQ technology first. Now they call it advanced hybrid closed loop. Advanced because this technology does one thing that the other technologies do not do. Um, and you know, all based on improving your time and range. And you see the third bullet point, and I'm gonna repeat this in a second, that basically up to every hour, it'll take your CGM value, the Dexcom G6 value, it'll predict what your blood sugar is gonna be in 30 minutes and give you your own correction dose. So let me just give that a little bit more information. So that first uh, uh, square at the top on the upper left, uh, it's automatic correction bolus when your blood sugar is predicted to be above 180 in 30 minutes. And that's based on frequently sampled numbers from your Dexcom, the rate of change, uh, you know, and of course we see the trend arrows. Now it gives it to you every hourly, every hour if you need it. And what it does is it calculates what your normal correction would be. It gives you 60% of that, not 100%, and it subtracts any insulin on board. It's all in a coordinated fashion not to stack your dose. So it's, it's, a, it's frequent small correction boluses. And that is what really makes the system quite unique. Now, just to give you the other rules of their algorithm, it'll increase your basal rate if it predicts your blood sugar is gonna be over 160 in 30 minutes, and it'll decrease your basal rate if it predicts your blood sugar is gonna be less than 112.5. Don't forget that 0.5. And then if it predicts your blood sugar is gonna be below 70, it stops the basal rate altogether and it will, it will restart it as your blood sugar starts to increase and go above 170. Now, one important thing for all these hybrid closed loop systems, the word hybrid means it's not a fully closed artificial pancreas. Uh, you still have the bolus for carbs. Uh, and this is a typical picture of uh, my uh, older Dexcom monitor when I was shooting through the roof well above 200 after a meal at full of carbs. And through the years of having type one for so long, I look at the shape of these curves and they, you know, maybe just because I'm so strange, I think of other pictures that would fit that tracing. This one, this is my favorite especially when you're really frustrated with a blood sugar going through the roof, even if you bolus early. Now, how does the Control IQ uh, work during exercise? They, they have a pretty, um, at least simple algorithm as it looks like uh, on the face. Basically, they, the goal that they shoot for is 40 to, to 140 to 160. You change your setting on your pump. It'll give you an automatic correction bolus, not when you're, not when it's calculated that you're gonna be above 160, but if you're gonna be above 180, it'll increase your basal rate if you're above 160, and it'll decrease your basal rate if it predicts you're gonna get less than 140. So it picks a range of 140 to 160. If it predicts within 30 minutes, you're gonna be above 160, it's gonna give you a little extra basal rate. And obviously, if you're below 140, it'll decrease. And if it predicts in 30 minutes, based on your CGM value, that you're gonna be below 80, it'll stop your insulin. And during the Q&A session, um, Jeremy and I have had some experience with exercise, especially we both have Pelotons now. We compete with each other. He gives me a 60 point uh, uh, handicap because you know he's only you know 40 years older than me, uh, younger than me. So um, we find that you have to really find your own method to avoid hypo during exercise. It all depends on uh, the intensity of your exercise, the duration, things like that. Now, what about sleeping? We we're on our way to Hawaii this year, our last live TCOID at the end of February. There's Jeremy with his cute little neck cushion, totally passed out because he had like four or five beers. Um, and just to give you the rules, at night, you put into the pump what time that you are your sleep hours. 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. And what happens during those hours, it really uh, is quite aggressive. It's really trying to keep your blood sugar between 112 and 120. 
If you're above 120, your basal rate will increase. If your blood sugar is predicted to be below 112.5, it decreases. And if it's predicted to be below 70 in 30 minutes, it, your basal rate stops altogether. A really important thing to notice on the slide is that it does not give you those automatic hourly correction boluses. Just doesn't want you to get low at night. And all the hybrid closed loop systems you can see the blood sugars at midnight, you might have a standard deviation like this, and then as it gets closer to 5 a.m., 6 a.m., the standard deviation gets really tight. And all of these systems work really well when you're sleeping. And so that's, that's an important point. And I've heard some, some of my patients put it on sleep mode all the time, and that's a whole different issue. You have to figure out how to use these devices to fit your lifestyle and your blood sugars. This is just kind of a download of the control IQ and you, it gives a lot of information, but you can see the blood sugars. You can see on the second level, the different boluses and how much they gave. Uh, you can see the basal rate modulation at the very bottom with the little uh, blue rectangles. And you can see the activity. You can see that the little drop with the black square around it. In fact, I can use my pointer even. Um, and that is right here. That's the auto bolus. And then you can see here starting, you know, almost at midnight, the little Z's and the person sleeping dur during the shaded area. So there are no auto boluses at that time. So there's, um, there's a lot of different icons at the bottom. It takes you a while to figure out which ones they are, but they all mean something. But uh, the downloads are very instructive. And I say not only for healthcare professionals, but mostly they should be instructive for you because it helps you uh, put uh, your exercise and your sleeping and your boluses and your carbs with your blood sugar. And something like, we didn't have this before. All we had was the, the glucose numbers in the olden days with the glucose meters and in the CGM in the early days. But you know, knowing when these other activities occur make a big difference if you can figure out what the heck's going on with your diabetes. So there is the Tandem app. It's called T-Connect. It's gonna be available to everybody very shortly as soon as next week, I've, I've heard. And it, you can see on the snapshot off my cell phone, really, really, really nice visuals. It's got your blood sugar, uh, your trend arrow, and you can see that on your phone, your Apple Watch, and on the tandem pump. And you can see how much I stacked my insulin this night. You know, I got pizza that was really uh, thin crust, but I just cranked away. And, you know, I love that last, Oh, you can look at your, your basal rate, your last dose, and of course the rage bolus. So that, um, but this was, this was a rage bolus that actually worked. This is sort of a summary of the control IQ uh, and the different modes in the normal mode, the sleep mode and exercise mode. I'm not really gonna go through this for the sake of time, but you could look at the recorded version of this uh, when we post it and then you could freeze it. And all of this information you can get uh, on the Tandem website. Let's talk about looping. Now it's important to know that Jeremy and I were looping a two, at least two years before the Tandem Control IQ came out. Jeremy was using an old Medtronic pump. I was using an Omnipod. And I can tell you, it was a game changer. And it continues to be a game changer for so many folks. We also wrote a nice piece on our website, the difference between our experiences with looping and the, the TANUP control IQ. There's a picture of the um, uh, what it looks like on your iPhone. And let me just show you some, some closer ups. And it's important to remember, it's not FDA approved. Here's a snapshot of Jeremy's phone. Look how many emails he's had in there. And he said to me right before we started, what are you going to say about that? I said, I'm going to tell all you folks that did not get a response from Jeremy, if you emailed him, that is why. And uh, there's a picture right over here of what the app looks like. You can't just download it off of Apple, uh, off, off the App Store. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but I can just tell you in general, it's very easy to get set up with Loop. I just called my two buddies, Jeremy and Rayhan, and they set me up. And there's actually a, a friend of mine in town named Scott, and he, I, I encouraged him to start a little, uh, company that helps people get started on loop. So here's a picture of the of what it looks like. You have to have your iPhone to have it work. You carry a little Riley link and it's a really nice visual. You got your blood sugars, 
you got your active insulin, you got your insulin delivery, you can see when it's giving you more or less, you can see those little upside down uh, uh, triangles. Uh, maybe they're not upside down. <laughs> and uh, that's when the bolus was given. And it has a lot more information if you go deeper into the app and the active carbohydrates. So, you know, I, I wore the Omnipod for over 15 years and I was looping. That's a place that I took, that's a picture I took for uh, where you put your pod. I put it on Instagram and I really don't put it there. I put it on my back, but on different areas, just having fun with it. Here's a picture of the looping uh, app again. And one thing I like about it, as you can see up here, in this dark, it, dark dots are the actually, the, your actual blood sugar based from your Dexcom. And the dash line is the predicted. And like any hybrid closed loop system, you have to be honest with it. You gotta, you gotta put in carbs. You have to really put in the information uh, so that it can predict your blood sugar. And the algorithm always works better when you put in all the information. You can see at the top, it gives you your blood sugar. It tells you what the basal rate is. Right now, you can see that the basal rate is turned off, probably because the blood sugar is predicted to go down. Um, and it tells you, you know, it tells you how long uh, your sensor is going and how long your pod's going to last. And uh, you don't carry the Omnipod controller. Remember that it does not work with Dash. It works with the older Omnipod. Um, and so it really is um, a, a system that has helped thousands of individuals, not FDA approved. It's a do-it-yourself, open, open source. So it's it's amazing app. And I have spent, I would say, sometimes months and years convincing a patient to go on it. And remember, the looping was out long before the control IQ. Now, this is uh, Jeremy's tracing when he was looping. He sent it to me and he said, what do you think of that? Uh, and his time and range is 100%. His, his best, day, best day was October 16th, 2018. Since then, you know, it's all been downhill. No, I'm just kidding. And the reason I say Jeremy Pettis LLC, that stands for looping low carbs. On any of these systems, if you eat a really low carbohydrate diet, you may not need to bolus at all uh, and or bolus very little and your time and range will just be amazing. Now, this is the picture he sends with it just to show off uh, that he's, you know, doing better than I am that week. Now, what about the Medtronic 670G? This is my, I only have two slides on this. It's been out many years. They get kudos for coming up with the first hybrid closed loop. Um, it was the first basal rate modulator. Um, they don't have an auto correction bolus. Uh, it works well overnight, like many other hybrid closed loop systems. You still require uh, meal. Uh, you still requires meal boluses like other systems. Little typo there. Um, you it uses the Medtronic sensor, and you have to prick your fingers at least four times a day to stay in auto mode. These other systems, you're in auto mode pretty much 24/7. Uh, does not have sharing capability in real time, doesn't have Bluetooth yet. They are coming out with 780, the 680G, um, and that will have advanced features. Um, and the, the diabetes tasks during the day are not really decreased. Now, many of you are on the 670G. Um, I've met many patients on the 670G, and if you work the system, it works for you. And once again, uh, kudos to Medtronic for getting the first hybrid closed loop past the FDA, which has really driven competition with other folks. This is just a quick uh, download from one of the Medtronic patients in the early days of testing. You can see everything to the left of the red line. Uh, the person is on just a regular pump and CGM. And, um, and to the right is that the hybrid closed loop is active. And you know, a picture says a thousand words. Um, you know, you'd much rather have control like on the right. Okay, now what about the bionic pancreas, the islet. Um, Jeremy and I are doing one of the uh, clinical trials. Um, and this is an amazing system. This is the first totally uh, closed loop system. Think about this. There's no carb counting. There's no carb to insulin ratio. There's, there's no insulin, insulin sensitivity factors. Uh, there's no setting of basal rates. 
no insulin adjustments all by you. When you start this, when you start this system, all you do is put in your body weight. That's it. And then it learns about you uh, and it learns about you over time. And you have no input to your diabetes. And the results are pretty amazing. Now there's two systems. There's the insulin only islet and there is the islet with insulin and glucagon. They call that DASI glucagon, a stable glucagon. And there's a dual uh, infusion port. So you can see it in the upper left. Go back for a quick second. You see these two infusion ports right there. And um, what I'm showing you on this slide is the, uh, each patient going from usual care to insulin only, um, to insulin only using faster acting aspart. And you can see the time and range is just going from 60 to 70 to 71%. And these are in clinical trials. Uh, I've seen data on people who have, uh, depending on your baseline A1C, you might do a lot better uh, if, your, if your initial A1C was good compared to other folks where it's higher. Now, um, if we look at this, this is one of my last slides. Um, this is comparing the insulin only bionic pancreas, the islet, compared to the system that's using the bihormonal, where it's infusing insulin on the way up, glucagon on the way down, and you can keep your blood sugars in a very tight range. When I first looked at this, I said to myself, what? That doesn't look too different between the purple and the green. So uh, when I looked at the numbers that used to be below in small font, I realized that time and range is going from 71% to 79%. The percent of patients with an A1C less than seven went from 50% to 90%. And also the number of hypoglycemic reactions were decreased by 50%. So this is the bomb, folks. Uh, I do think that we're in a great uh, position right now with the hybrid closed loop systems, but there are more advances on the horizon. And Tandem and Medtronic and Insulet are also going to be reaching for that totally closed, high uh, closed loop goal. So now it's time for Q and A. Um, I'm going to have Jeremy come on over, um, and I am going to unshare my screen, and we're going to go to the pictures of us. Uh, thank goodness for changing the background. And uh, so, Jeremy, I don't know if you want to come on in. Um, yeah, you know, Michelle was sending me some screenshots. Okay. I think I can, you know, we can just close and just say that, you know, this is going to go online and people can ask questions there. Is that right? Yeah, I can say goodbye or you say goodbye. Okay. I'll say goodbye. I'm not sure if I'm, uh, come on over and help me out with this. I, I'm not sure if I'm still on. Uh, so I did stop the screen sharing. All right. Here, let me, let me look, let me release that. There. You can see us. Okay, cool. So Steve and I have actually been quarantine buddies, as you might have guessed by now, that he's kind of in my quarantine circle. But um, I, I love that we're figuring this out still. So thanks for bearing with us. Um, in classic TCOID form, you know, my computer crashing, starting with a Jaeger, you know, background, I just, I love it. But a lot of, <laughs> a lot of good information. And um, this is being recorded. Um, we're going to post it on the TCOID website. Steve and I have been doing a lot of videos lately on just all things COVID related. So check it out there. And then you can keep posting questions there. You know, I've just been seeing comments in the, in the chat. That's just, you know, you guys have been just chatting it up. So that's great. If there's any specific questions that come up, you know, that you want to uh, post online, um, do that. We'll get back to you. Um, and then, like I said, this will be recorded so you can send it to whoever. And then the next thing is going to yeah. be when we interview a couple things, actually. Yeah. Um, when we interview the, the type one patient coming stand up. Stand back. So like. Stand back. I don't have to breathe on you. Oh my goodness. We both um, yeah. And then the other thing, well, they can't see me. Now I gotta like bend down. Here, here. Yeah, I didn't, it's not my fault you're taller than me. So, um, and the other thing that's gonna be really cool is that Steve is gonna be celebrating his 50th type one anniversary uh, coming up here in just a couple weeks. So I'm gonna interview him like Barbara Walters. Um, <laughs> oh, please. And, and just ask him <laughs> all things about his life with type one diabetes. And my goal is gonna be to make Steve cry. And we'll see if I can do it. But I think that's going to be a lot of fun. I just I just heard this plan just now. <laughs> um, I, I also want to uh, tell you all that um, we will spend serious time, go through the blog, and answer all the questions. Uh, we do appreciate you putting them in. And I guess like, um, you know, we were talking about planning this earlier today, and someone on our staff said, you know what, you always run out of time. 
uh, on, on these webinars. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was, uh, Jeremy, I thought your, your information was excellent. And um, the first time I actually heard it. And I'm, I'm encouraged. And I do think we're going to get through this. And it'd be nice to get through it together. Yeah. Now, I just got to figure out, I can't go to the Apple store now. I don't know what to do with my broken computer, but we'll figure it out. Try G-O-O-G-L-E, yeah. and then you can Amazon. That's hilarious. Yeah. I got I to gotta have a computer to Google things. But anyways, <laughs> all right, guys. Hopefully, thanks yeah. for tuning in. We had a lot of fun. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll see you soon. We really appreciate it.